Hello, hello, and welcome to the Rock Metal Podcast. I'm your host, John Harris, and today on the Rock Metal Podcast, we have Where the Devil, who are working on a collective body of work known as an extended play, and in the meantime, they are releasing some banging singles, taking the Newcastle scene by storm, as from what I'm told, I mean, I'm not there, but I'm told that it's it's a storm. I'm being joined by Rob today to share some more... <laughs> Must be a cool night if you're hearing it all the way over there. Mm-hmm. That's right. And Rob today is going to share some more information about what the band is up to, what they got going on down the pipeline. So, Rob, welcome to the show. Hey, hey. Beautiful. Okay, now, we were talking about initially, you guys had this body of work, you're releasing some singles because you want to be able to promote the record. I get it, I understand. I Brief question, I guess, is... What is the situation in Australia? Because the last little bit I'd heard, you guys were arguably back to normal. Yeah, were uh, until the last couple of weeks, mate. And this feels uh, this feels very much like last year. We had a run of shows booked, and right before that, uh, two weeks before COVID, everything down. But uh, yeah, it, it did seem like things were back to normal. Uh, unfortunately, we've had a bit of a wave in the last couple of weeks. It's uh, uh, locked down for a lot of areas, masks, all this sort of thing. And unfortunately, we seem to be seeing that uh, each week. Uh, you know, shows coming through town, no, cancelled, even, you know, right down to local acts, just uh, things being cancelled. So uh, we will <laughs> see, mate. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. But we're hopeful for our next bookings. We'll, we'll see how we go. Okay. Because I used to hate my interviews with Australia because you guys would be like, oh, yeah, we're just doing everything. It's great. <laughs> Rubbing it in. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, yeah, you know, from what I what I hear, about the, the rest of the world, mate. Yeah, maybe we've we've been pretty lucky. But um, yeah. uh, in saying that, yeah, the entertainment industry hasn't been too lucky at all. You know, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of things cancelled. Moment, just pure moments of tangency. You know, I like the pun. <laughs> what is that track about, by the way? Oh, mate. Uh, you may be asking the wrong guy there. You got the drummer instead of the singer. Oh, um, no, the, I got the drummer. Yeah, yeah. Um, the drummer was the only guy that was going to get out of bed at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning. Um, Usually, look, as, am I right? As, sorry, mate? Usually, am I right? Usually, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, mate, look, as far as lyric content for any of the songs, um, I think... Uh, our singer Ben, he went through a, a, a period there of a mess, messy sort of a custody battle and whatnot, uh, bad relationships, that sort of thing. So keeping in mind that um, uh, look, he's in a happier place these days, I guess, but uh, Moments and, and some of the other songs that have been put out were, were written quite a while ago. So I think um, those bad experiences are definitely, they've been sort of uh, lyrical fodder. So, um, you know, betrayal and... Uh, uh, you know, bad relationships and whatnot. They're, they're sort of a lot of the, the theme for, for those songs. Okay. So this is some pretty deep stuff, but since I got the drummer, we'll stick to things that you can hit with sticks. Let's keep it simple. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So I've zeroed in on your kit. I'm watching the music video for Moments of Tangency, and I've zeroed in on your kit where you guys are playing in the woods around spotlights and it's super creepy, but actually maybe take us through that. What was that like playing in the middle of nowhere? It looks like the middle of nowhere. Maybe it's not. It's it's not. It's funny. We've been asked that a few times. Would you believe that's my backyard? Oh, that's awesome. That explains how you were able yeah, to get the lights. Yeah. 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 I live on a, a, a bit of a property here, mate. So, um, yeah, lucky enough to have the room to do that. Uh, we actually have the rehearsal space here too. I'm on, on like five acres. So, uh, yeah, it was a, a, a good looking setting for it though, mate. Um, uh, yeah, the guys in the band were like, we had an idea for what we wanted to do for a clip. It's like, that'll work perfect. So, um, yeah, it came up really good, mate. Did that with a guy named uh, Kai Smith uh, from Kai Smith Creative, and, yeah, he's done a great job. Okay, five acres of land in Australia. Tell me. Tell me more. What do you What do? You do? Is it do you, winery? Like, what's going on? No, nah, mate, it's not. That's maybe not as big as it sounds. Uh, actually, just uh, my family, they're just uh, into equestrian, mate. So uh, we need the space. And being a, a loud, noisy drummer, uh, being on a bit of property, that works out pretty well, mate. So <laughs> it certainly does. Okay, so let's chat about this. We got we got obviously too many symbols, but that's obviously the point, right? So, <laughs> what's going on with your ride here? It looks like you've got a Zill Bell and then a ride. And is that another 
symbol on top of the ride? What is that? Ooh, without actually looking at the picture, mate, uh, yeah, there are a few bells on that kit. Yeah, so got that big mega bell ride, and then there's a couple of ice bells around the kit, mate. I just kind of like that uh, that sound, that effect. So um, mm-hmm. maybe a few more symbols than the average guy. Yeah. So if I'm, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm looking at the little, like this, Ooh. you might actually see that just behind me. So we're actually in the rehearsal space here at the moment. So Okay. Yeah, slightly different drum kit. How many drum kits do you have? Uh, down to two at the moment. Yeah, um, I actually yeah culled a fair bit of gear recently, but um, yeah, did have a, a, a quite a few. But it gets to the point where you just don't don't feel like you play them. Yeah, it makes sense. It's just selfish to hold on to something when somebody else could be getting joy out of it. Yeah, well, that's uh, that was definitely snare drums, mate. I had a collection of probably about fourteen of those, and uh, yeah, culled quite a few recently. Maybe a couple, regrettably, but uh, you, when you find you keep playing the same things, you know, you're like, well, sort of, what's the point? So, yeah, what do you look for in a snare drum? Are you more of a black beauty kind of guy? Are you more of a wood kind of guy? Mate, I was a, a collection of all sorts. So, uh, at the moment, I, I've really done a backflip with this band. I was a a very much a bonham kind of guy everything really large um in this band i'm using this tiny little piccolo snare drum and that just come about uh, in the recording sessions uh we ab a whole bunch of drums and i just pulled this drum out it was i've had it for years it was just a, a cheapy we just threw it up to see what had happened and it just killed and that's sort of become i don't know maybe part of the way that it all sounds yeah so it really cuts through and yeah it works a treat yeah Piccolo snares, that takes me back to the year 2000. I mean, corn, Deftones. Yeah, yeah, well, definitely a Deftones fan, and uh, a few people have commented on that, yeah, that um, in that, uh, uh, yeah, we're not in our 20s, we're a little older, so uh, <laughs> that's definitely our influences, you know, the, the, you know your, your corns, your, your Deftones and whatnot, so maybe it just kind of works in with the sound, yeah. Yeah, well, if you think about it, it kind of does. I mean, those, especially like, we'll just use corn as an example, or Deftones, we could use them as an example. You got these really thick, stupid thick guitars. And you got to try and get a snare to cut through that. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, right on the money, mate. Yeah, we found uh, a lot. What are things we're doing too? They maybe get a, a little thrashy in tempo. So, so same deal, mate. A, a, a wall of guitars. Yeah, I just really need to cut through that. So, yeah, that that nasty little piccolo is working a treat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you got a wall of like, I don't know mid-range we'll call it or guitars to deal with your mid-range snare is like you gotta you gotta figure it out okay do you deaden it all uh no no that one's just uh live and wide open mate just uh cranked up about as tight as i can get it wow and uh yeah ding, ding. cool yeah so looking at the kit we've got with like three crashes of china at least two hi-hats at least two hi-hats it looks like yeah there's Two high hats and a stack hat. Yeah. What is a stack hat? Isn't a high hat already stacked? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I guess uh, what I'd call a stack hat, uh, it's just two two symbols stacked. So in this case, it's a china and a high hat, which gives you that kind of somewhere between uh, somewhere between a china, somewhere between a high hat, some kind of a white kind of a noise. So yeah, yeah, seems to work pretty well with this band. Hmm. Okay. So, do you are you influenced at all by like? Dream Theater and like, cause I'm trying to remember his name at the moment. I'm probably gonna get a lot of flack for this in the comments, but uh, Mike Portnoy. Yes, Mike Portnoy. He was renowned for using stacks. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually saw Mike in clinic maybe 20 years ago. He was great. Um, I wouldn't list him as one of my biggest influences, but yeah, definitely a, a fantastic drummer. Okay, and then we've got Coded Heads. Tell me about the Coded Heads. Coated heads. Uh, that just happens to be in that session, mate. I, I probably chop and change a little bit. Um, actually, uh, for all the drummers out there, I guess, I've, I've recently done a backflip uh, back to pinstripe heads, which I used maybe 20 years ago. So, wow. um, But, uh, yeah, I, th- I think for at least a couple of decades before, mate, I sort of swung between uh, coated emperors and clear emperors. Okay. Something that worked well for me. What is the tonal difference and how does it work for you in choosing – the drum heads. Uh, okay, so as far as uh, coated and clear emperors, I guess you'd say um, maybe uh, a little more attack with the coated heads. 
Um, as for going back to pinstripes now, that was just per chance. A new kit that I brought had them on there and uh, just a lot fatter and rounder. Um, yeah, it was actually a bit of a why did I stop using these moments. Yeah, they, 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 they sound great. Yeah. Now, if I remember correctly, I'm more of an Evans guy, but if I remember correctly with Remo, Emperors are thicker than Ambassadors, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, double ploy head, yeah. Okay. Now, in the studio, I know sometimes, even though it might cost more, Ambassadors will get used because they ring more or whatever. Did you do something like that? Well, the, the last session, which we actually tracked here, um, we actually AB'd two kits. So aside from all those snare drums, we actually had uh, two full kits tuned, and I tuned them radically differently. And uh, interestingly enough, you're saying with the ambassadors, it didn't really work so well for us to have that wide open uh, ringing sound as far as toms. We play a lot of, uh, I guess you'd say, syncopated parts, and to have that that long, ringy, boomy sort of a sound, it just didn't seem to work. So uh, I have heard that, yeah, ambassadors and whatnot, great for that wide open tone, but I guess if you're playing things that are a bit quicker and syncopated, it just takes up too much space. You, you really just want the attack. So, yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. A lot of recording advice comes from recording like Toto and Michael Jackson. So, <laughs> <laughs> when you. Yeah, and, and the rooms they get to play in and the engineers they got to do it with. <laughs> Look, it's an, an interesting animal, mate. Um, I think what as drummers we think is a. A fantastic drum sound you, you know you'd, you'd think you want that those nice big open sounds but what you actually want to capture in in a studio it's maybe a different thing and sometimes uh, as much as i used to cringe the idea you know tape things up muff them down and pillows in the in, in the bass drums and whatnot from a recording perspective that may work or from a song perspective that may work so um definitely something we maybe found uh, the hard way with the last session in that I, I had that kit big and boomy and, and roomy and it's like, oh, that ain't going to work. So, yeah. yeah, especially at those higher tempos, you got to pop, 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 pop. There's not much. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So maybe the the, the last song released, uh, Misery, uh, slower sort of a track. You mentioned Deftones, maybe a, a little more that vibe. Well, yeah, maybe that's going to work more with that, a lot of the beats sort of across the toms and whatnot, but uh Whereas the song before it, you mentioned Moments of Tangency, well, yeah, definitely faster and more syncopated and the work on the toms there, it, it needs to be punchier. So, Yeah. Now, initially you mentioned a Bonham kick drum, which is like a, what, a 26-inch kick drum? Mate, I had two of them, so you can imagine <laughs> what it was like. Man. So your fundamentals. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much the response I'd actually get for, uh, when people would see that, mate. So I had two kits that were of uh, Bonham sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them being a, a double bass kit, though, so two 26-inch bass drums. You uh, you kind of need to warm up and do the Chinese splits to play that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you, it's a good thing you do kung fu on the side, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that scene in all those uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme movies where they're spreading his legs, that's what you got to do. That's pretty, cool, pretty close to it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so your fundamental note on a 26-inch kick drum is hitting at like 40 hertz or something stupid. Um, what are you, what are you playing? Take, yeah, what, what are you playing now? Is it something more traditional, like a 22-inch? Yes, mate. Yeah, I went back to more traditional sizes for this band. So, yeah, 22-inch kick drum, 10 and 12 toms, 16 floor toms. So uh, as much as I'm a, a huge Bonham fan and I love playing on that great big kit, it just doesn't work for this band. And I'll tell you what, it's a hell of a thing to lug too. So Yeah. You know, funny thing, I was just watching a video where Paul Gilbert was going through his pedal board. Uh, yep. And he changes his pedal board depending on obviously what, what his set list is. But it was like uh, the guy from JHS Effects was saying, hey, take us to your just a general pedal board. And he was going yep. over his Univibe pedal. And he's like, I wish I could use this thing more often, but I don't play in a band that would use the Univibe Sound and just immediately as you're saying, like, man, I would love to have this Bonham kit. And how many times somebody listening in right now, you're in a band, you're a guitar player, you're a bass player, you're a drummer, you have the ultimate sound in your head, but you have to recognize I'm not in that band. Yep, yeah, absolutely. I've had this discussion with quite a few people. Um, and you know, not just drummers, as you say, it could be bass players. I, uh, an old mate out of another band, uh, we, we talk about that with basses. Uh, he primarily plays a jazz bass. He, he likes old basses, but um, he'd use a, a P bass for recording. You know, he's like, he hates the sound of that, but in the context of the music, worked a treat. So, yeah. um, as I said a little earlier, I think the, the studio is a different animal and uh, getting a sound that blends with, with all the other instruments. It's not necessarily that 
perfect sound that you had in your head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that that's reasonable. Yeah, I was chatting with a a pickup manufacturer recently, and he's he's talking to me. He said, "Well, are you a Fender guy or a Les Paul guy?" And I said, "Well, if I were playing by myself in my bedroom, I love Les Pauls, yep. but I've yeah, been yeah. In, I've been in recording situations where they don't fit in the mix." Yep, yep, that's the one. Yeah. You know, if I were to zero in on like a guitar that's going to always fit in the mix, and speaking of Les Pauls and Led Zeppelin, Page played a Telecaster a lot because those Bonham drums were huge. Yeah, yep. And Telecasters just fit <laughs> every single yeah. fucking mix. So, I think that's one of the enjoyable things about the studio, getting to play around and experiment with that. So, as I said, last session, two full kits and, and a multitude of snare drums there to just. Uh, try out and compare so it's cool to not come in with um this is my ideal sound you know just actually experiment and try things out and see what works in the day so Mm -hmm. yeah okay so you guys did all the recording uh at your place what about like mixing and mastering uh so that's uh james strezoff at 1618 studios so um james is the singer and I guess primarily the writer for a great band called Take My Soul. And uh, we were actually meant to play with them guys last year, which is kind of how we met. Um, so, yeah, it did just work out. James, unfortunately, has moved in a state on us. But uh, he come down and, and uh, because I have the space here, we actually tracked uh, everything by the guitars here at uh, here in our practice space, which was great. It's, it's good to um, just be comfortable and, and, and do it that way, you know. But um, uh, prior to that, the, the, the session before that, again, we tracked the drums here. That worked really well, but everything else was, uh, was tracked in Jones Studio. Okay. How come the guitars? What's up with that? Um, I think, uh, if anything, that's just control. So uh, one of our guitarists, uh, Ben Hosking, just uh, he's a, a pretty technologically minded guy, mate, so he was able to just go off and do that himself. So um, it was better for him just to, to, to track that at home himself you know and and, and and everything's a digital world these days too mate um you know he, he didn't it wasn't you know walls of amps and cranked old school you know it's all, all plugins and whatnot so it just gave him the opportunity just at, at his own pace and and just you know his own controlled environment you know nice and comfortable yeah yeah whereas the other guys they were, they were really keen to just get in and work with james and um you know just try sounds and throw things at the wall and see what happens so yeah two different schools of thoughts i guess yeah yeah the wall of plugins nowadays yeah that's the one yeah it's ridiculous <laughs> yeah uh, ben i'm not not really too up on it ben actually just brought himself a kemper unit so from what i gather with those that's basically it will profile anything so mm-hmm. I, I, I look around the room here at the amps are in here and you can use that unit to profile all those and it basically just digitally recreates anything so um i know uh uh, tracking with james he actually owns one of those units too and um he loves going and buying all sorts of vintage gear and profiling it then moving it on so uh a a unit full of every amp you can imagine yeah exactly yeah different than an emulator an emulator emulates and you can combine emulations an emulation of a fender amp and a marshall cabinet if you want to Whereas a profile means you're literally taking, take my soul, you're sucking the soul out of an entire signal chain. So it has to be the amp and the cabinet and the microphone. It has to be the whole signal chain. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Cool. All right. So we chatted about everything that we can chat about today. Owning land in Australia, piccolo snares, pinstripe drum heads, different symbols. We chatted about um, John Bonham kick drums. Uh, we chatted about misery. We chatted about moments of tangency. We chatted about you guys do have an EP coming up, but it's sort of uh, contingent on shows. But you got a lot of singles coming up. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, well, next single, twenty seventh of August. So, we actually just shot a video clip uh, last weekend uh, again with Kai Smith Creative. Um, the the big exciting part for me about that mate being the biggest Tommy Lee fanboy in the world, uh, I shot fireballs off my drums. Something I've wanted to do for years. Wow. Yeah, it looks very cool, man. I'd love to be able to show you something. But uh, 27th of August, that one comes out. Uh, we have a show at the Hamilton. Hamilton well, try that again. A show at the Hamilton Station Hotel on the 27th. Uh, that's within Grave Scholar of Sin and Plague Dweller. So that'll be sort of timed with that release. Cool. Uh, and then yeah, a few other things in the works, mate. Uh, hopefully that EP out later on the year. So, awesome. and uh, another, yeah, another two tracks in the bank, sort of just waiting their time for release. So. 
Mm-hmm. Awesome. Sweet. Just drag Tommy Lee into the, the argument. That's good. When I played yeah, drums, you like fan mine. Yeah. When I when I played drums, well I still do. But I remember just being in awe of Tommy because he's a Thundercat, man. Like I saw them live. That that guy just gives everything. Like Bruce Lee kicks, that's how he plays the drums. He's just like I don't know how he gets that much weight into everything he's doing. He's just Yeah, that's a lot. It's ridiculous, man. I, I, I was uh, the first time Motley came out to Australia. I was seventeen, and I remember it. You know, when you go to a big show, and maybe that first song or two, where the, the, the kick drum hits you in the chest, and you almost feel a little bit nauseous. Yeah, that was Tommy's whole kit. Like he hit a rack, Tom. It was oh my god. Yeah. So it was uh, amazing seeing him live. I said I've been a, a lifelong fan, mate. Um, I think unfortunately he's probably a little more famous for the celebrity side of things than the fact that he's just an amazing drummer mm-hmm. so yeah big influence on me yeah sweet all right well rob thank you so much for coming on to the rock metal podcast today no thank you mate great to have a chat appreciate it